So hello, uh, welcome all to the W3C call for uh, the 15th of July. Um, the topic for this call is going to be the data set site specification. Um, so this is looking more at the uh, harvesting or data consuming end of the spectrum. Um, so less about what gets published and how and more about how you find it and how you consume it, um, which we've tended to focus on less. Um, reflecting that, I think, uh, is, I'm just going to make a, a preemptive apology. Um, the data set site specification is a little bit shambolic. I uh, flung it together over the last couple of days, based very much on existing practice um, for our data set sites and for our data catalogs. Um, so, the document is in a little bit of a rough draft form at the moment. And I will start sharing my screen so that you can see exactly what I'm talking about here. Um, let's see here. Okay, so. Um, so, as I said, um, the dataset site specification is a specification for how dataset sites are supposed to be structured. Um, so that is to say the kind of splash page that links you to the data feeds um, themselves. Uh, the general picture of how this works um, so far has been very centrally directed by the Open Active Initiative. Um, so there's a bunch of code that is defined in a GitHub repo that automatically, automatically outputs a template and that template uh, takes some basic data and presents it um, as embedded JSON on an HTML page with some human readable information. Um, so it's been kind of a de facto standard simply because there's that one code library which is generating everything. Um, and that's how everything's worked so far. Nobody has tried to put up a data set site uh, without basing it on open active technology. So there hasn't been that much need for the standard to be explicitly defined. Um, and indeed, the specification as it currently just barely exists um, is really just a codification of what that library does right now, um, along with some pointers towards future functionality. Um, the overall picture of how this works um, or what the, what the JSON uh, structure is, is building on uh, DCAT, um, on schema.org, and Google Dataset Discovery. So it's intended to be compatible with, with all of those uh, vocabularies. And we're very much helped by the fact that DCAT version two has published a mapping um, from DCAT to schema.org. So essentially what we're doing is publishing everything in a schema.org um, structure, uh, which allows it to be, uh, the data set to be discovered and uh, described unambiguously. Um, so I will take you to the data set API discovery is 0.1 document. Um, so yeah, please note that version number. This is extremely, extremely rough. This is building on a base that um, Nick wrote, which was, I think it's fair to say, boilerplate and some headers. Um, now it is mostly boilerplate, some headers, and a lot of tables um, listing out various attributes and what their value should be and guidance concerning their requirement level. Um, it's also worth notice, noting that in addition to the somewhat um, unfinished state of the document or uh, rather sparse state of the document. Um, some of the work in particular for the markup related to booking API implementation um, is using the schema web API type. This has not been finalized. This is pending integration into schema.org. Um, of course, we're hoping to be as um, in a, as aligned with schema.org as possible. So our guidance here might change depending on if the discussion about web API moves on in the future. 
Um, that said, they're aiming for a release date of schema 10, um, including a finalized version of Web IPA in late August. So that window is going to close fairly soon. So everything that's defined in the document right now um, is a little bit wobbly, depending on schema.org discussions, but it looks like it is likely to go ahead in something very close to its um, current form. Um, so issues with the data set site specification. Uh, the first, as I've noted, is just the rough state of the document. It needs a lot of tidying. I'm sure there are typos in there. Um, it could certainly do with a lot of preamble text because right now there's really just sort of tables of attributes and possible values. So preamble text guidance and all of those things need to be supplied more fully. Um, but I think, uh, oh, and, and if certainly if you review the document and you see any of those, just please open a GitHub issue about that. Um, I'll be tidying as I go along over the next couple of weeks. Um, but any more, what, what's the saying? Um, to a sufficient number of eyes, all bugs are shallow. So yes, please do just uh, give any advice you might have or, give any, or raise any questions that, that occur to you in the GitHub um, space. Um, but I suppose I'd open up with um, a more general question, which is, in a way, what is this standard actually aiming to achieve? Um, this is really a scope question. If you look at the end of section 1.1, 1 .1, um, you've got a little note at the bottom that says, note that although the specification of the Open Active Community Group, uh, it is designed to apply to any open data set where an API is available to manipulate it. So that's actually quite a, quite a wide scope. That's saying any any kind of data set that is specified and is available over an API, um, this data set site specification uh, will stretch to fit. Um, and I wonder how necessary that really is, uh, simply because really what we're describing here, like a lot of open active um, standards, is a kind of specialization of schema.org. Um, but unlike, say, the opportunity specification or the open booking API, what we're doing here is a lot closer to the core of what schema.org is trying to do. Um, you know, schema.org constructs like data set or data catalog or distribution um, cover the case of data set publication, I would have thought fairly well. So is what we're producing here a general um, standard for publication of any kind of open data? Or is what we're producing here really a specification specifically for how you publish open active data? Um, and including potentially then a lot of guidance very specifically focused on, on open active opportunity data. It might be helpful for some context here. The, um, the reason I guess the um, original draft included that, that um, statement was because the uh, the APIs, sorry, the, the specifications of open active generally are quite um, modular by design. So the idea is you could use RPDE if you wanted to with any data structure, it just so happens that the modeling spec is the one that we're using in, in open active. And so they're, they're kind of, they're entirely separate. And the modularization is helpful because it means that actually the standards themselves can be quite focused on what they're doing and not so much on what other things are doing. Um, with this specification, yeah, the idea was that um, exactly like the other specs, if this is a more general spec, then it fo forces us to focus ourselves on um, making sure it only does this and not other things. Um, and so I think the discussion probably, I guess doing it both ways around, I feel like making it more general is it more generally applicable is, is helpful because there is a lack of, I mean, apart from the the work of web web API um, community group, which is kind of doing this in parallel, that doesn't actually go to that. That doesn't describe what this describes. This describes a data set and an API being described together in a way that is compliant with with DCAT, with schema, um, and and generally is 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 well tested. And that that's quite a useful package of something that people might start to use outside of what we're doing. Um, 
And I guess the idea is if you make anything that's more generally applicable and other people start picking up and using it, obviously sustainability increases because you've got more um, eyes involved and um, more people engaged in that. The, uh, the flip side of that is that, um, and this is around conformance, so we've got this kind of idea of conformance testing and um, something about how we, um, how we describe what features of, for example, the open booking API are implemented by a particular implementer. And that's quite specific to us rather than more general. Um, and um, actually I have a, an issue that I haven't yet submitted but I will on this because uh, I did say to Tim I would uh, about um, representing feature profiles uh, of the specification. So I'll put that in, mm. in GitHub after this. But um, there's a good question there because basically um, we're not even looking at that that issue. Um, are we? Uh, is it in scope of this to talk about feature profiles of what's been implemented? And if so, then that's a good argument for making this more slightly more specific to our use cases. Um, unless we come up with a very general way of describing feature profiles, which also could be useful. Um, but if not, I guess I'd argue there's no harm in having it more generally applicable because it's, there's lots of advantages to that. Um, and maybe we could do conformance in a way that's generally applicable, which if we think about that in the design, will make it more useful. I mean, if we come up with another API, that's, you know, whatever standards are defined down the road, if we've done all this more generally, then that's possibly more useful anyway. Just some thoughts. And sorry, when you say feature profile, just to be clear, you mean something like in the open booking API, this implements the standard booking flow, this implements the approval flow, that kind of descriptive level? Yeah, that's right. Um, I, I, will, um, I will quickly um, format the, the thing I was going to submit to, uh, to GitHub so you can, you can see it. But yeah, that, that's exactly it. Like, a, like a, these, are the, these are the list of features which um, if, if you're publishing this data set site, you're almost claiming, you're asserting to the world, this is the list of things that I've implemented. Um, I've, I think I have views on that, I think, uh, but I'd be interested to hear uh, what Tom and Nathan might, might feel about this as people more on the uh, publishing end a lot of the time. Yeah, I think as a consumer, I'm much more likely to use it for like a way to find documentation and a way to find what, what type of flow, like booking flow they, they support or more importantly, what kind they require. So if it requires an approval flow, mm -hmm. then that information is going to be very helpful because we're probably already, I guess we're not necessarily uh, everyone's case in that we'll normally have pre-existing agreements with these people before we start consuming the feeds. Mm -hmm. um, because of course, we're primarily focused around booking rather than just availability. Sure, and I guess even with booking, you're probably, that's a good point, when you're looking at the different feeds you might choose to integrate with, actually knowing what flows and features they've implemented is probably going to be a deciding factor on which you integrate with next or whether you're even yeah. able to. Yeah, exactly, because if there's like five or six that we need to integrate and two of them already use the flow that we've already programmed, then we're more likely to do that than go with like a more complicated flow or a flow we don't necessarily support. Okay, so that's a, that's a useful filter to you um, if you had that kind of information available to say, right? Yeah, it would be, yeah. Uh, Tom, any, any thoughts on, on your end? Has, has Tom stepped away for the moment? Sorry, um, I was kind of half sidetracked doing some other work. Um, from my perspective, um, can you just, I missed like the actual point, but I understand that it's kind of around what information we need to make a decision on whether we would integrate with a specific feed. Is that right? Yeah, I guess it's about the specificity of, uh, I suppose, 
it could be the specificity of, of, of how the data feed is described, and then for booking, the specificity of uh, how booking is described. So whether or not you want to be able to pull information about which flows are implemented by a particular feed. Yeah, I would. Endpoint. Yeah, that would be helpful. So as descriptive as possible, really, for us. Right. Okay. So it, it lowers the barrier uh, from a consumer point of view. Um, yeah, if you've got that information forefronted. Right. Yeah. Um, and I think I think that's sort of why I, I got some alarm bells about about that notion of, of it being a wider or more generic specification is just that I feel like if the point is to describe a data set and an API for manipulating that data set together, you know, that's, that's a very, very wide use case um, with a lot of specifics. So I, t I take your point, Nick, about RPDE, where you know, it, it's kind of a, a wrapper format almost. It's very lightweight. Um, and very generally applicable. So that makes it useful conceivably across a lot of use cases. Um, I don't know if that's true. Yeah, there's obviously there's a whole range of APIs that range from the very generic kind of RPDE type to the very, very particular for, for manipulating very particular kinds of data. So I get a little bit worried about trying to make a claim for the generic applicability because then I think like, well, you know, what if somebody's got like, genomics data. Um, are, we, are we making a claim that this is going to be a useful standard for that use case? Um, it, starts, it starts getting a little bit shaky to me about where, the, where you draw the line uh, between a generically applicable kind of frame and the more particular um, details that you implement. So would it be a good um, a good halfway to try and get a bit of the benefits of both to say that this, although this is targeted, I mean, words to the effect of, although the specification is targeted at the open active use cases, it is um, designed with more general applicability in mind. I guess something that says we are not doing this, it, it's not so specific that you that we're hemming ourselves into a corner with it almost because it's, you know, just us. Mm -hmm. um, but equally, we're not going to, as you say, realistically, I mean, practically anyway we're not going to go to all the genomics we're not going to get enough use cases from a broad enough community to get consensus on this as a general uh, and what have we got that appetite to get that that consensus mm -hmm. from a general point of view and obviously we're using web api and some much more um um loose specifications i'm not sure it's fair to say like vcat and um web api very loose and so um i i think it like i still think it would be useful for someone to know that this is the stuff that Google is happy to consume out of, you know, and and I guess that's the, I'm kind of wondering whether, and I know obviously Google's um, got lots of plans, but if if there was a, a nice document that Google could point to when they were come, when they come to implement this themselves, because obviously they have to implement web, web API within their interface at some point, and and we've surfaced this in the Scheme.org community as you know a, a nice document that explains how. DCAT and Web API work together, and 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 this is something that fits with all of the specs that they've got as well. Then there might be a chance they'll actually use it themselves to, you know, to to think about this, and or maybe even take ideas from it. So, is there a way that we can kind of phrase it and frame it and describe it and not go over the, you know, like not spend um, three pages of preamble, not that we would, talking about open active requirements. Do you know what I mean? And, and going off into detail about why we're doing this to get more people active and da, 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 da. we could just make this very clearly like pithy in we're doing this to make data set sites discoverable with with reference to a use case of open active kind of over there but not not the center and frame of this document so if someone like google read it later they would be hopefully quite quickly into the detail of oh wow you got you guys have really thought in detail and solved the problem we're currently thinking about oh maybe i'll pick this up and you know do something with it as you say, without making any grandiose claims that we've consulted with the masses and solved uh, DCAT, for example. I mean, this isn't <laughs> this isn't DCAT three, so <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. I mean, I guess I guess the concrete question is just really where where guidance lives on a quite specific level. So you know, as you I think as you rightly pointed out, Nick, um, you know, where do we put? suggested values or mandated values for um, how the web API is described. 
Mm -hmm. um, we put that in this document. Do we say, you know, for open active data, here is how you describe the following open booking flows, um, or does that live in a guidance document somewhere else? Mm -hmm. that points to this. Mm -hmm. um, I feel like the downside of the of the latter approach is it just adds one more layer of confusion for developers trying to get their heads around it. Um, if you say so, mm -hmm. you know, here's it's tricky because if we really wanted it to be a generic document or as generic as possible, you wouldn't have pointers pointing the other way, right? You wouldn't say for open active, see all of this stuff. Mm -hmm. um, so you sort of have to start developers off on a general framing document and then point them towards this more generic thing. Um, so it gets a little bit tangled how it fits together. Although that, that, in fairness, currently the way people implement this is they just use the tools and use the, the documentation and those those things reference this, which is still kind of in in flux. So I, I suppose there's an argument that if we had it general, it wouldn't actually change the way people approach it. It'd just be that current implementations is backed up by something quite concrete and well thought through. Um, but, uh, but the other way around of looking at it is we can't really call it conformance to a specification if the detail conformance information is in guidance. So for example, yeah. if, we're, yeah. if we're mandating certain set of values, those really should be in the spec so that yeah. we can talk about conformance. So yeah, so maybe you're, maybe you're right. Maybe, I mean, maybe it's not as, not as far as like all guidance goes in the document because obviously that's, that's kind of what some of the developer docs are for um, in terms yeah. of more, more detail, but, um, but yeah, like, we, we, we anything that the validator validates i guess needs to go in the spec maybe that's a good yeah that's that's a um that's a very handy principle anything the validator validates yes indeed um yeah and i think that point yeah it points towards a situation where this is specifically about open active i mean perhaps the preamble states you know this is a useful pattern for mm. um and there could even be more specific guidance in particular sections saying, you know, this is relevant only to open active, et cetera. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, I think that's, I think that's a good point. We do need there, there to be one source of truth um, about what you're doing when you, when you create a data set site. And that should be ultimately this document with the idea that other guidance flexes and changes. Yeah. Yeah. And to that end, actually, we probably then want to do things like, like we do with um, the modeling spec version two, where we've started to put arrays and not arrays on things mm -hmm. and, and, and get a bit more, more specific than web API even is, yeah. um, sorry, than schema.org even is. Um, but, but having that level of specificity, specificity allows for um, someone who's parsing this to have reasonable confidence that the structure is going to be not as uh, crazy loose as schema is sometimes. Yeah, that's a, that's, a, that's another good point. Yeah. Schema.org is like uh... It's nice, but it's wild and woolly. So, <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, so I think I think that points towards a sort of moderate narrowing of focus for what we're specifying, but with the idea of of narrowing it, I suppose, as as little as possible. Um, but but targeting it precisely on the open active use case. Um, all right. Um, I've got a more specific question. This is, this, sorry, this is mostly a, a Nick question. Um, I noticed that in the data set sites, so as I said, this is really a kind of a transposition or a transcription of what's on the data set sites right now, which is to some extent an artifact of um, the tooling we've got. Um, there's a reference to the open graph and open data write statement vocabularies in the existing um, data set sites. What is the value of those? I just wasn't too clear. I just saw them in there. I wasn't too clear what they were doing. Oh, that's SEO. That's all. Um, oh, right. Okay. So the SEO, uh, there's there's a bunch of SEO requirements that basically... Um, oh, I'm sorry. I didn't uh, realize that. Okay. Um, yeah, they might be doing that in the spec. Um, Okay, um, well, let's, let's move on from that then. If that's got a clear answer, fantastic. Um, 
the next point I suppose is guidance. And I guess all I'm doing right now is flagging up how useful it would be to um, get feedback on the required recommended optional properties. Um, as I said, the specification as it exists right now just reflects what we've got being output by the, the libraries in place for data set site generation. Um, so the guidance implicitly is that everything is required. Um, this is, to my mind, probably too strict. Um, however, I'm not clear enough on existing practice and what existing publishers and consumers find useful or feasible to publish or consume. So it would be great to have some eyeballs on what the guidance is regarding that. Um, I was going to say, because most, most fields at the moment can be filled out for open active with pretty defaulty values. Like there's not much that you couldn't. Um, and, and we probably want to do things like make the discussion URL recommended because we want to mandate that people have a place that they can raise issues with the data set. And maybe we don't want to mandate that's GitHub. Maybe that's a recommendation, but you know, like the stuff that's best practice kind of build that in. Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, yeah, I, I think um, I think implicit in what I was saying was that yes, we do want best practice, and we also want want it to be realistic for people to achieve. Um, let's just hear as many voices as we as we can about that, because um, it's it's just not clear to me um, where the where that balance lies. Um, and I guess that, I suppose it opens up a wider question of how far this can or should be divorced from the tooling that currently exists anyway. Um, from a sustainability point of view, my feeling is this does have to exist in a more or less self-standing way that somebody who doesn't even know we've got a GitHub repo somewhere that does all this for them, you know, could pick this up and implement in some kind of straightforward manner. Um, on the other hand, again, if we see it as quite tightly tied to the open active project as it currently exists, um, then perhaps it's easier to make things required simply because we're already supporting people in publishing those fields. Yeah, that would be that would certainly be my feeling on it. Um, but as you say, also, but but from a sustainability standpoint, good to make sure that this is self-standing and even if you're using whatever language you know that isn't supported right yeah that's i guess that's the primary use case for this yes if you're if you're writing everything in eiffel or something uh yeah right. you need to be able to re-implement um although even then you know the, the template is there um the template's really the end point isn't it that's true you're right yeah that's true the, with the template yeah that there's very little that people will then need to do yeah um Okay, so that perhaps points towards required and recommended being easier to support than would be the case with most other standards. Yeah, and, and especially as we want to really push people to make their stuff discoverable, I guess that's kind of part of the point of open data. Yeah. So this is this stuff isn't costly, it's just an extra field like filling in the field that says uh, publisher with your name of organization, for example, like these are it's a it's a one-off task all of this is 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 a one-off task most in most cases or a one-off configuration task for customers if, if for bigger systems yeah although it's interesting in our open data how often that's missing um so <laughs> but yeah um yeah that's true um but but we yeah, have again, making it making it recommended or required i suppose uh pushes, but it, pushes it's forward. interesting because if, if we um we look at all the data set sites that exist right now, I think, I think we've got 100% coverage across these properties um, where they're, I, I think, you know, everyone's got documentation, everyone's got discussion URL. Uh, mm -hmm. That's really been a push. I, I think partly because the ODI um, uh, either guidance or recommendation or mandate, I don't know what, when we, this all came from the ODI's guidance originally years ago, I guess. Um, and um, part of that was, yes, having a way of discussing what the data looks like is really important. Mm -hmm. So I guess that's kind of what's led that to be there. Okay. Um, so I guess we can be fairly stringent there. Um, 
So does anyone have anyone else have anything to add on that on that point? Uh, okay, Poss possibly a bit abstruse and and into down into open active tooling uh, questions. Um, so uh, my next question, uh, and this is really about what's useful to, to data consumers, but also to some extent what's helpful for data publishers. Um, the specification says that it gives a guide to both the machine readable aspects, so essentially the JSON structure of data set sites, uh, but also the human readable aspect. Um, and when I think about it, I'm a little bit fuzzy on what good human readable, what documentation for good human readable standards looks like. Um, it would be possible to be on one end of the spectrum extremely vague about this and to say, um, you should give information about, you know, you should have the links to your data and you should give information about the publisher in a human readable way, that's it. Um, or even people reading your site should be able to conclude the following from the text description that you give. On the other end of the spectrum, you can specify a clear HTML structure and what should populate each of the tags that you mandate um, within, within the standard. Um, I started going down the latter path when I was creating the document the other day with a kind of you know, CSS selector and here's the data that that selector uh, should point to. Um, I'm not sure that that's the best way of going about it because obviously if you're a publisher um, that imposes a very particular structure on your page, which might be good from the point of view of, of parsability. On the other hand, it might just be a massive pain. So I'd be curious to canvas the opinions of everyone on the call about where we should be on the spectrum of vagueness to precision and how that's um, recommended. Um, I think uh, as so far as you're defining data, um, I think going down the CSS route can be a bit too, like, like you mentioned on a publisher site, it could be mm -hmm. terribly complicated to try sort that out with your existing CSS rules. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and I feel like a tag based approach might work a bit better um, using the extension to HTML5. Mm -hmm. We can just specify your own tags. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah, so it's probably worth saying actually that the, um, I, th I, th I, so I must admit, I misread that part of the, the, the draft, um, what those were doing is, um, but, uh, the heading is actually very clear. <laughs> Having read it again, <laughs> uh, I just looked at the CSS selector and thought, "Oh, that's good. That's that's interesting." Um, in terms of um, uh, the HTML annotations that DCAT recommends, I thought that's what that was doing because um, DCAT actually um, it's R RDF A or something I think, or micro formats, or there's a name for it in Schema, um, which is basically when you bake it, you, you don't use the JSON format, you bake into the HTML itself all the different metadata properties. Mm -hmm. So the current, scheme, the current data set site template does both. It has metadata properties baked into the HTML to conform with the DCAT and some of the older DCAT parsers um, that are around some of the um, um, names escape me now, but there, there's a bunch of um, open data directories that parse DCAT to do all of that for you. Um, and so um, that would mean things like um, data.gov could read it and pull in the relevant metadata as easily as Google because it's kind of supporting both. And there was no, I mean, this is before DCAT2, bear in mind, and before the JSON-LD really took off as the preference for Schema.org because um, Schema.org, if you even look at the docs, it's all, um, originally it was all very much the other formats first um, across the examples. So, um, let's see what the names of those formats are. Microdata, RDF, a and JSON-LD. So I think it's microdata that it's supporting, but I'll check just now. Yeah, so microdata. Uh, see that? Yeah, see the microdata or RDFA. That's that. So whether we want to, I mean, I think it would be good, maybe as a should, uh, mm -hmm. if if not a must, to recommend that they and and a profile of which RDF 
slash microdata, whichever the properties are that, that are most widely recognized by the open data community that are, are, are included. Um, I don't, I, I agree with Nathan. I don't think CSS selectors are the way to do that because that's really quite restrictive and much more restrictive than the RDF a right. requirements. I mean, as long as it fits within the RDFA structure, I think it doesn't really matter what the tags are on the page. Um, so I guess to separate things out, there's RDFA and microdata on the one side, um, which yeah, suggesting potentially should be a should, if not a must, about making sure that we've got maximum, because the, the point of this page is for, for discovery. So might as well make sure it has all the bits um, for all the systems. And then the other side of that is human readable. And my suggestion there is, is just to make it um, maybe not, not super, super vague, but something as simple as um, ensuring that all data described in machine readable form is available in a human readable form on the same page um, that is clear and well structured and doesn't, um, I don't know, maybe you want some access, accessibility things in there too, but do you know what I mean? Like a high level, like these things you should do, um, the template obviously does that for you, but just to make sure that if you don't have a human readable aspect to this, then what you could end up doing is publishing like one of those really vague pages where it's like everything's in the JSON LD, and if you look at it, it's just the title and the description. Yeah, yeah. You have to like right click and view source to find out what what's supposed to be going on. But we obviously don't want that user experience for everyone in Open Active to have to go through. So if if the machine readable matches the human readable in terms of access to content and it's clear maybe that's enough without going into the specifics of what HTML structure is used to achieve that. Okay. Um, and I guess it sounds like the action coming from that is, uh, I guess, on me actually just to, uh, yeah, look at the extent to which microformat, RDFA, et cetera, remains useful in discoverability. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. So, the, so that's actually a third part of the, of, of the specification really. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah. Other, non json ld machine parsable vocabularies so I, yeah i put open graph and open data rights in that same bucket there's a there's basically a bunch of stuff that we were with the open data people i mean it's i don't know what the odi's current guidance is on this as well that would be interesting um so i've done a bunch of of, mark, of of random markup that you're supposed to add to all these things uh how much of that i mean a lot of this was is four years old now this information so how much is current um, yeah, and I, I really don't know. I mean, and it's funny, I think if you talk to different developers, you get very different opinions about, you know, I think there's some sectors where, you know, microformats and RDFA have, have taken off and others where, you know, uh, in fact, I think probably the majority of the commercial world hasn't. Um, so, yeah. I mean, I mean, like I said, I think, I think if we, if we uh, the point of this is to uh, about musts and shoulds kind of give the ideal outline of what we what everyone to do and if we've already got a template that does it for them as well yeah then yeah I, I don't see any harm in in almost going slightly overboard with specifying open graph rdfa open right i mean this the point of this page is really to make sure that anyone that reads it um oh yeah that, that's it um if you ever apply for an open active uh, sorry an open data institute certificate that tool reads the rdfa i think or microdata in the page it doesn't read the json ld because it predates that um, so you can, you pulls all the stuff out into the certificate for you, for example, uh, one of the tools that does that. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, there's, it seems that if the entire point of this page is discoverability, it seems like there's no reason to not just include all the things. Yeah. Well, again, I think, I think it's, I guess the only negative on that would be again, for somebody who's publishing it without using our existing libraries or, or templates, right? Um, yeah. if it's, you know. <laughs> I would, I would put the same data in four different formats, say, is, you know. Yeah, so I guess it's about shoulds and musts, isn't it? Like, can, can we can we put it in as a shoulds uh, unless, yeah. And then, and then here's a template that does it all for you and includes the shoulds and the musts if you want. Yeah. Okay. Um, and I guess the, the final point that I've got down there is, uh, I think maybe a sort of fairly arcane one um, at the moment, which is, uh, let me see. Um, right now, the mapping for DCAT version two um, maps both human readable and machine readable descriptions 
to um sorry yeah Hmm. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> the, yes, the DCAT mapping maps the DCAT machine and human readable properties to the, the description field. Um, however, there is a proposal on the table to have a distinct property endpoint URL um, to capture the machine readable aspect of that um, in, in web API in future. Um, so could could we um uh, as I know we haven't got much time left Tim but would it be possible to bring up the actual issue on the uh, the the group the W three C group because it would be also good to get people on the call to contribute to the issue directly if they've got thoughts um before the um so this is uh, uh, sorry for, uh, to add further context what Tim's just said there that, uh, or has said earlier in the call so we've got a web API a proposal in with schema .orgs, uh their own machine to actually change, add to schema.org some properties, which hopefully then will get adopted by Google and everyone else. Um, and so one of the outstanding questions in that proposal, which is gonna, which is due to be answered very shortly, um, because they're gonna kind of include that in, uh, they're gonna include that in the, um, uh, the next version of schema's release, which I think is in August. Um, and so it's really a very simple semantic question, which hopefully everyone from a technical perspective on the call will have a, a, a clear view on. And then we can contribute those views ideally to that discussion, which will help move that forward in terms of schema.org's own processes. Um, that's, the, that's the thing. That's it. Yeah, there we go. Yes, um, and I can I can include this um, link in the call notes as well. Um, yeah, so this is just making a more as as uh, the user uh, summarizes it, making a more explicit separation between human readable and machine readable endpoint descriptions. Um, yeah, it seems like confusing these two would be just incredibly irritating. <laughs> so, so can we make this super tangible? Um, sorry, Tim, to, would you mind clicking on uh, maybe the new tab, the, the web, web API discovery uh, link at the top there and just and just opening up from there, from the readme that it w will appear um, the, um, the, uh, in that repo, sorry, in that repo, uh, RFCS. Uh, then in the readme, there's a link, which is the right, that's it. So that's, this is the proposal that is being put forward by the, um, another community group parallel to us, the W3 web API discovery community group. Um, so Mike's very kindly allowed me to jump on as editor of this document so we can move it forward because he didn't have much time to do that. So if you scroll down to uh, the documentation section 3.2, um, sorry, not scroll down, click on, yeah. Uh, 3.2 and then uh, yes right so this is really concretely what we're saying so if you scroll down to that the little bit of uh, JSON there uh, that's it so you've got so this is what right so this is the current proposal from the DCAT uh, 2 working group in their mapping now context here is DCAT 2 working group um, were doing that at a point in time before schema.org had any other features so they haven't necessarily tried to do the mapping taking into account all possible options. They've just done the mapping to whatever schema.org happened to have at the time. Um, and what they've decided to suggest is that both human and machine readable um, documentation go into one property as this shows in this JSON and use it and, and then in, by implication use a different encoding format to, to, to specify which it is. So in this, you can see that the uh, human readable documentation is text HTML, that's the first element in the array. And the second and third elements are machine readable documentation. And you can tell that by the encoding format that's in there. Again, they're not text slash HTML, they're a machine readable format. And so that's what they're proposing is the mapping. And as, as that issue discusses, um, the, the issue makes it clear that uh, although that is the case, that that is what is being suggested by and proposed by DCAT, um, actually that creates some ambiguity. Because if you want to parse out the links for human and machine readable separately, you need to whitelist those MIME types to know which is human and which is machine readable. And that assumes that you've obviously got an idea about all the possible MIME types of either. And that might be straightforward because maybe you only want to pull out text HTML as the human readable ones. Um, 
or it might create more complexity um, because that's just that's just another thing that you've got to code in and, and it's not entirely clear. Um, so uh, I, I personally can go either way on this. Having done the editing of the draft, I put it in conforming to DCAT2 because um, that's what uh, seemed easier and the, the, the least friction. However, um, for good reasons, um, some folks in the community have, have said, is that really the right way? Um, and, and have we thought about this? Maybe we should think about endpoint description instead. So the alternative proposal is, instead of having one property and only differentiating based on the MIME type, have two properties, one property for human readable, one property for machine readable, and just split those across both. Um, and that's literally the difference. And I can see good arguments for both sides. So I guess it'd be really interesting to see what you guys think of that. I think when you're parsing um, a list like that, being able to very quickly tell what's going to be human readable, machine readable would be very useful. Like you mentioned about the whitelisting content types. If you whitelist in both directions, you still might miss some content types, which would fall through gaps. Mm -hmm. And there might be other content types that are very similar to what you're looking for. So for example, text HTML and text plain, or even like text markdown. Mm. These are all kind of valid human readable ones mm -hmm. that you might not necessarily afford to put them in your um, whitelisting. Interesting, yeah. In order to render them, and if you don't know how to render Markdown, for instance, um, you know, are, are you by necessity on fetching this having having something ready to render it in human readable form? Um, and so you would have a whitelist because you've only got the things that you know how to handle. Uh, I'm, I'm trying to work out if, for the human readable part what um if, is there a case where you need to do something to process it that isn't on a, a, a an actual thing that's going to be read by a human <laughs> you see what i mean at which point it can either handle a format or not i i, I sort of slightly informed by the um sort of uh, rss approach where you know you hit it asking for a text html and you get a web page with a blog post in it and you hit it um, asking for XML, for instance, and, uh, or Atom, or whatever it happens to be, and you get that same content, but in machine readable format. And this feels what what, what uh, Nick showed on the proposal there feels kind of like that. You, you know, you, you you get what you ask for. It's it's the same thing, but you're just asking for it in, in a different language, different representation. So you're saying that I guess in in the case that we wanted to, for example, render this to a web page, you know that browsers can only handle a set number of types of uh, human readable forms. So in order to put a link in the browser that went to uh, view more documentation, for example, just thinking practically what it would look like, you, you would probably want to put a view documentation button in the browser to know what you could render uh, that button for, which links that button would be appropriate for. Um, I guess you would know you would just take what you understand of browsers they can probably deal with html maybe there's maybe xhtml maybe whatever else they might deal with um and um then then infer from that so you you think chris that you think the whitelisting approach actually could um could work i was, I was certainly fishing for an anti-case to say that it couldn't work if you see what i mean rather than accepting mm. that it was a problem Mm -hmm. uh, it's interesting because browsers, browsers are an interesting thing because they are, they, they can represent a lot of different formats, and so if they say accept star dot star when asking for one of these things, then you you, you uh, star slash star, then then you, you haven't really got any clue as to what to give them. <laughs> That's true. Yes, yeah, so I there's new formats all the time as well, isn't there? In terms of, but then, but then arguably there's only a limited number of formats that realistically you'd want to post people to an HTML's HTML PDF um, doc uh, I guess there could be different types of word documents uh, yeah I mean I remember on an earlier call we were talking about sort of subspecies of markdown we would like to support um, so I guess there is <laughs> there's always going to be um, edge cases there yeah um, so I, I, I'm actually wondering very back towards Nathan's idea that the 
possibly there is a thing that is this is intended as a human readable format <laughs> you see what i mean at least gives you if, if if one of the things you're given back even if you don't know for sure whether you can support it is being flagged as it should be human readable then you mm. can throw the browser at it and hope that it can cope with whatever it is that's, that's being asked to render and I think it's yeah. acceptable for things to be borked. If it's marked human readable and you pick, you, you pull it in and it looks weird to you, um, nothing particularly goes wrong there. I mean, it's not intelligible to you. Um, and of course, you're not too sure how to serve it on to, to subsequent clients. But if it's marked machine readable, there's a sort of strong presumption of how usable and automatable that's going to be. Um, so I think it's useful to have that distinction asserted right right up front i would have thought um so that, yeah, the other the fault tolerance i suppose of those two kinds of um guidance are, are very different great well so it's, it's, i mean it sounds like well i mean it, yeah so this is really great feedback because i, I think when when that um the, that proposal point in the proposal was was added? Yeah, I think this consideration about how easy it would be in, in practice wasn't maybe as clear. Mm -hmm. um, so I wonder if it's possible. I mean, you know, if you guys are, um, are able to just post the thoughts that you have on this particular issue, um, just so that that is, and you know, please be as um, we don't have to all agree with each other. It's a good discussion um, to, to, to have. It's, just, it's not me trying to rally consensus from, from another group. It's more just good technical people with some, some thoughts that will have a vested interest in the problem. Um, so um, I've just posted on the group chat to Zoom the, um, the issue. Um, so yeah, I mean, if you're able to just quick post a, a thought on there uh, to, as part of the discussion, and, um, and it, that would be really useful to, to just progress that chat. Uh, which leads into the final point on the on the slides, which is just scheduling here. So as I mentioned, it looks like um, schema version 10 will be hopefully shipping uh, late August, um, which means that we can make firm statements in this data set uh, site specification after that point. So in the very near future, before September. Um, so yeah, gathering consensus early would be very helpful in order to make sure that um, uh, the existing web API proposal gets integrated into schema.org um, as soon as possible. Um, and then I will also work on integrating actions from this call and also just general proofreading and any other issues raised by that point. Um, with two minutes left on the call, are there any comments people would like to make either on the scheduling or more generally on any other business arising? from me okay i'll just uh thank you all for being on the call then and um yeah so we should be able to progress this into something that's not a zero point something in the in the reasonably near future um fairly quick quick uh two things sorry tim as we've got two two minutes um and colombo need to have a one more thing moment uh now uh, so uh, there's a couple typos I noticed when skimming the, the doc, which I can I can mention separately, so I won't spend time on that now. But there was one thing that I noticed that was missing, which was the booking service. Um, was that an intentional thing to miss? Uh, and just to uh, get, get an understanding of that, if that was, or if it's not, then I can just add it as a as another. Yeah, just raise that as an issue. No, it was not intentional. No. Okay. Uh, as I say, it was mostly codifying stuff that's already on there. the existing data set site. So, and that's not. Perfect. Okay, great. And then, um, and then the other question I had was just around this um, issue of the um, the conformance stuff. So I posted it up now. Uh, I'll I'll amend it after the call. The um, conformance certification, uh, not the conformance certification, but the links to whether to link to conformance certifications within feature profiles uh, or not to do that. Um, but I realise that's probably not a one minute topic. So I just kind of flagging that as something that might be worth. Um, coming back to or, or thinking further? Yeah, um, we, can, we can add it to the agenda for future calls. I'm not too sure. I think it might be kind of a hypothetical discussion for the present, but, um, but yeah, we can revisit it in the near future. Yeah. Yeah, that sounds good. Yeah, I mean, mainly, mainly to solve the problem we spoke about earlier about how do we get these feature profiles that I know Nathan at the top of the call kind of mentioned into the spec. And so I think there's two ways to do it.
doing that one involves conformance certs, one doesn't. Maybe we were thinking about more of the conformance certs route before, um, but just want to make sure that's not lost. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Um, that sounds like, and that, and that that is perhaps a wider conversation than than the data set site specification anyway. So it might deserve right. its own heading um, in future. Okay. Um, if that's everything, I'll thank you again at uh, ending uh, with laser sharp precision at the end of the hour. Thanks very much, everyone. All right. Thanks, guys. Thanks, guys. Catch you soon.